is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Ruin and Rising, before and chapters one and two. In these chapters, the apparat is trying to take control of the situation and of Alina. And thankfully, her friends know what the fuck is up and they come for her. But damn, that was... I did not like it. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Joanna for commissioning this episode. Um, it's been a minute since I finished the last book. And I realized like when I was reading the end of the last book where she is unable to summon light, I thought it was like a side effect of what happened with the, um, you know, taking in some of the Darkling's ability. And it might be like that's what sort of started it off. But once we get into this book, it feels like the main issue is that she is underground. And I find that to be sort of a weird, like, handicap to have, that you have to have some sort of, like, direct access to the light out, like, in the world in order to, I don't know if it was, like, that she needed that access after her injury from her encounter with the Darkling, or if it's supposed to be that she needs that access intermittently in order for the, the power to be sustained. Um, but that seems like a pretty big, like Achilles heel. And I don't know if the darkling knows about this, but I imagine that if he did, it would be pretty fucking useful. So hopefully she doesn't have any enemies keeping an eye on the fact that she grew really like weak and, frail while she was underground going off to report to him and tell him, Oh, all you need to do is build like an underground prison and she'll just be unable to do anything. Um, but this like whole series of chapters is all about her being a prisoner of the apparat basically. And it's awful because it feels very much like an abusive, like relationship um, where she has to put on a show and do things the way that she knows will please him in order to get him to agree to allow her to see her friends, like a major part of what he's attempting to do in a good portion of this is isolate her and keep her from being around people who are going to encourage her or give her any sort of support. And he fully knows that's what he's doing. And it's like, really depressing. It bummed me out. Um, it even bummed me out more so that in the end, she doesn't kill him. She decides that she's going to manage him. And her reasoning is like, what would the people say if I killed him? Who knows what could happen? I don't really buy that. I think if, uh, there was a, rumor and I say rumor, but it's the truth. If somebody circulated the information that the apparat tried to rise against her and was actually a traitor, I think people would be fine. You know, there are so many traitors all like it just happened so many times. I don't think there's anybody that they would hear about being unfaithful to the cause that would actually surprise them other than maybe her or perhaps Mal, because he is so devoted to her. Otherwise, I feel like people would be like, wow, really? Well, you know, you can't trust anybody. And it would just be like a passing shock and they would get over it. So a big part of me just kind of wanted her to like, make a an example of him, get him out of her hair, because he's really he has not been super helpful in a material way that I have seen other than kind of like managing the zealots that are drawn to her. And I am just not convinced she needs him 
or that keeping him alive is a good move for her. I don't know if he's going to play a role later and it's going to turn out that he's suddenly like more important than I thought. But as of right now, I'm just feeling like, mm, you know, I don't know. Um, but I guess we'll see. So to start off with before, this is sort of a, um, a weird one. The oftentimes they begin with like the boy and the girl. That's how they, these prologues and the epilogues have been structured. I'm curious whether that works for you guys. I don't really understand the reasoning for that. And I think I said that at the end of the last one, that it was something that sort of worked in the first one because you didn't really know the characters that well yet. And it felt a little bit like just an interesting tableau to sort of pull out, you know, and get a, an overview of the entire sort of where are they now moment. But I feel like once you get further in, doing that every time just isn't f effective. And it doesn't feel like there's anything really accomplished by using that device anymore. Um, but if it works for you guys, I'm just like, I always like to hear if there is somebody who got a completely different feel out of something than what I got, you know? Um, so it starts off in a different way without the, the boy and the girl, the monster's name was Izumrud, the great worm. And there were those who claimed he had made the tunnels that ran beneath Ravka sick with appetite. He ate up silt and gravel, burrowing deeper and deeper into the earth, searching for something to satisfy his hunger until he'd gone too far and lost himself in the dark. It was just a story, but in the white cathedral, people were careful not to stray too far from the passages that curled around the main caverns. Strange sounds echoed through the dim warren of tunnels, groans and unexplained rumblings, Cold pockets of silence were broken by low hisses that might be nothing or might be the sinuous movement of a long body snaking closer through a nearby passage in search of prey. In those moments, it was easy to believe that Izumrid still lived somewhere, waiting to be woken by the call of heroes, dreaming of the fine meal he would have if only some hapless child would walk into his mouth. A beast like that rests. He does not die. So I don't know if y'all have been watching The Mandalorian, but the first episode of the new season felt very evocative of this kind of uh, legend and threat. And it just really was like on point because I just watched that episode last night. And if you aren't watching The Mandalorian, as somebody who isn't a massive Star Wars fan, I enjoy Star Wars for what it is, but it's not something that I'm like, oh, I absolutely have to like, you know, have this piece of merch or whatever. I feel like The Mandalorian is a pretty fucking stellar TV show. It's very fun. And if you're interested in seeing a worm that eats people storyline, that is a, that is a show that you're going to want to check out because it is done quite well. That is movie quality special effects. So anyway, um, so that's how that starts. And then we get the boy brought the girl this tale and others too. all the new stories he could gather in the early days when he was allowed near her. He would sit beside her bed, trying to get her to eat, listening to the pained whistle of her lungs. And he would tell the story of a river tamed by a powerful tide maker and trained to dive through layers of rock, seeking a magic coin. So he comes eventually and he finds his way barred and he isn't allowed to see her. Um, he, when he would not leave, they dragged him from her door in chains. The priest warned the boy that faith would bring him peace and obedience would keep him breathing. Locked in her cell alone, but for the drip of the water and the slow beat of her heart, the girl knew the stories of Izumrud, Izumrud were true. She'd been swallowed whole, devoured, and in the echoing alabaster belly of the white cathedral, only the saint remained. So the way that the before section finishes is basically her slowly getting more strong, but keeping that hidden. And it was a weird thing because it seems like it's, it ends with, 
He did not hear their hidden language, did not understand the boy's resolve. He did not see the moment the girl ceased to bear her weakness as a burden and began to wear it as a guise. So I'm thinking we're going to start the next section with her stronger and fooling him. And it doesn't feel that way. I was a little bit confused. I, I don't know if that was just me or if I like jumped ahead a little bit. If the, if the intro um, with before is meant to be like where we're going to get shortly, just be patient and you can watch it happen. But I don't think that's it because she gets her power back in sort of a rush and it's not secret. So it feels like she's still as weak. Um, it starts off with her like, you know, standing up and she's like got her arms spread, but she's shivering and tired. Um, and she's doing this thing where they're like manipulating the light from an inferior to make it appear that she's summoning light to her hands, even though she can't right now. Um, the inferni let the light flare bright around me. It jumped and wavered erratically, then finally faded as I dropped my arms. Um, I stepped down from the platform, eager to be out of the apparatus presence, but my foot faltered and I stumbled. The priest grabbed my arm, steadying me. And she says, just uh, when he says, you're not doing well, she says, I'm just clumsy. I was stronger than when I'd come to the white cathedral, but I was still frail, my body plagued by aches and constant fatigue. That doesn't like I was so excited when it was like, oh, she's not weak. She's just pretending to be weak at the end of the before. But then no, but she really is weak, though. Like she's better than she was, but it's not like she's faking it which was what I was hugely hoping was going on, that she was pretending to still be weak and waiting to like plot and get her moment. And honestly, as satisfying as it is later when she, you know, has her moment after all, I was a little disappointed that she wasn't really like in on that. That wasn't something that she had planned. And it was just sort of an accident that she was prodded into I wanted this to be a trap that she laid. And instead, it's just something that sort of she she's it feels like it was a setup for her benefit on that everybody else took care of for her and she just needed to be there. And that's way less fun and interesting and satisfying to me. Um especially just the the way like I said, the prologue really feels like it's promising something very specific. And I don't understand that why you would set that up, but then not have that be the thing. I don't know. Is that just me? Anybody? Anybody at all? Like, I just want to know if I am getting my hopes too pinned on a prologue here or what if that feels like a record album. Um, but yeah, I just, I don't know. I, I think that I got super excited for it too, because that is what happens with Alina so much of the time in these books. It doesn't really feel like Alina takes control of her own destiny very often. Things happen to her. Things happen around her. She gets tricked. She gets like manipulated into a thing. She never really seems to be like in charge of shit. And I think that's part of why I got excited over the prologue was because it felt like, oh, she's she's laying the groundwork here. She understands the danger and began to like get tactical with it, you know? And I, I think that's really the main, I got disappointed because it was sort of seeming like the author was addressing an issue that I've been having, you know? And then she just sort of like, it, it's not even that she pulled back on it so much as I feel like she just completely dropped it or I completely misunderstood it, even though the language she used, it doesn't feel to me like it could be taken any other way. Um, so when it's, yeah, like I said, when it starts here and she's just saying, like, I was still, you know, plagued by fatigue and aches and yada, yada, yada. I was genuinely like, wait, are you really? Like, I, it took me a little further reading to accept that she meant what she said, because part of me was hoping that this was going to turn out to not be true. 
but never, it, it just, yeah, it was. Um, so he says a day of rest and she hears, oh, you're going to be like confined to your room. And she tells him that she wants to go to the kettle. When she says some time in the kettle, I thought what she meant was a big bath, that that was what they called the bathtub was like a kettle. Cause a lot of people will call, you know, um, to, that is, there will be a lot of different nicknames for a bathtub because they can be huge or small or, um, but what she means is that's what they call the kitchens. And he is rather resistant to this. And it turns out that the reason behind that is Genya meets her in the kettle all the time and they sit and talk. And again, he is trying to keep her isolated. Um, so let's see. Movement at the base of the cavern caught my attention. Pilgrims, newly arrived. I couldn't help but look at them with a strategic eye. Some wore uniforms that marked them as first army deserters. All were young and able-bodied. No veterans? I asked. No widows? It's a hard journey underground, the apparat replied. Many are too old or weak to move. They, pre for, pff, they prefer to stay in the comfort of their homes. And she's like, mm, no, he just doesn't want to feed people who can't fight is what's going on. Um, so she is already just like, not, she's, she right away is pointing out to us how like kind of mercenary he has become. He's just really practical is too generous a word. He has, he's heartless. And it's interesting because I didn't think that he had it in him to be like this. I really, the, and I think I sort of hinted at this, my feelings um, about the apparat in the last book, which were maybe he's really scummy, but he seems to be gen, like generally on your side, make use of him if you can. But I didn't, feel he was as much of a threat as he turns out to be here. I thought that he would be slimy and continue to be somebody that you couldn't completely trust. Somebody who was always going to have their own agenda and their own shit that they were going to try and pull on you. But he's much more actually effective in all of this than I expected him to be. And it really worries me that he has the influence that he has and she keeps him alive. Because I feel like if you manage to summon that sort of support from people, you're going to be able to do that again. And I am not sure. He seems very apt at manipulating the impressions that people are getting of a situation. He does basically what Trump does, right? Where he takes something that's like, yeah, this is a genuine real thing that's happening, but he completely flips it around and creates a narrative around it to misdirect everybody. And these people are, have so much faith in him as a person that they wouldn't, that he wouldn't lie, that they believe it, even if the evidence of their own eyes seems to contradict that. Um, so yeah, she tries to say that she should go to the sick and the elderly and not hide. And he is telling her that, you know, she has to hide to survive. She's obviously not as worried about her, um, about her safety as she should be. And so he has to be worried about it for her. All these things to just sort of keep her in the dark and not interacting with people. Part of this is again, his attempts to isolate her. Part of it is also, I think, to keep everybody from being able to see her up close she's not doing well. And it's pretty clear she's not doing well. Like, I think that if somebody got to see her closer up, it would become apparent pretty quickly that she's not okay. Um, so let's just, oh, she, right. I forgot. Here is the part where she overhears some people calling Genya the, um, the ruined, I think is the, what it translates to. It's the name that at the end of the last book, she basically said was like against the rules. 
And they are not really intimidated by her, apparently, because they're using that word in her hearing and not that concerned about it when she overhears and sort of yells at them for it. It's one of those little signs to us that she's losing ground with people. Her influence doesn't matter as much if her saying that shit is forbidden, what the fuck, doesn't really seem to have an an impression on people. Um, and yeah, here, um, I, the priest settled himself in a low wooden chair and gestured for me to take another. I tried to hide my relief as I sank down into it. Even standing for too long left me winded. That was really the moment where I was like, oh, she's not faking it. What the fuck? This sucks. Um, and I, I understand in some ways wanting her to be like wanting him to be more of a threat to her. And so having her be actually weak might feel like a way to increase tension, but it's just that she has been put in a weakened position so many times now that how about the tension is just trying not to get caught. How about the tension is creating a plan with friends that you're involved in and him trying to hide that from him somehow, you know, the, prologue says something about he didn't see their secret language. Well, apparently I don't either. I don't know what that means. Like it's, it's, there's all these promises that we don't really get to see. And I, unless this is like something that I don't know, I really don't even have a theory on it. It just feels like the intro to a different book. Um, So she's describing how like, exhausted she is finally here and really like getting into the detail about um going to see Genya and you know how hollowed out she looks and uh this is when she tries like he tells her that she needs to trust him that he's obviously he hasn't earned her trust yet and she has to lie and be like of course I trust you but it's clear to both of them that she is full of shit. And what's so frustrating is that he doesn't need her trust because he has complete control over her. So it doesn't actually matter. They're both the, the whole conversation is just a series of lies to one another from beginning to end. Her pretending that what she wants is to like go out and be among the people because that's my job. I, I mean, like I could be wrong, but she hasn't really enjoyed that part of the job in the past. I don't see that having changed for any particular reason. She is looking for a reason to get outside. Now, what's unclear to me is whether or not he, the apparat, knows about the connection between her lack of access to the sun and her power dwindling. Because she seems really aware of the fact that this closeness to the flu could potentially help her. But at the end of the last book, when she couldn't summon light, she didn't seem to know why she couldn't do it. Am I mistaken in that? I feel like that, like the end, she is trying to do it and she can't. And she wonders if like the power has just fled her forever. She really doesn't know. And I'm wondering if I'm misremembering because it's been a long time since I finished the last book. Am I misremembering that? Or did she somehow like figure out in the meantime that that's what the problem has been for her is that she hasn't got access to outside? Um, I don't know. But I'm curious whether since she does seem to fig have that figured out by now, if the apparat is trying to keep her from going out just because of the isolation or also because he doesn't want her to become more powerful because then she will be able to defend herself. Um, so this is when he says something about how I want the best for you and your friends. If anything were to happen to them and she gets very defensive of them in a way that isn't as like submissive as she knows he wants to see from her. And he gets a little bit like, aggro with it. Um, accidents happen underground. I know you would feel each loss deeply and you are so very weak. Um, so at this point, 
she lets this like trick happen. Uh, rage coursed through me. From my first day in the white cathedral, threat had hung heavy in the air, suffocating me with the steady press of fear. The apparat never missed an opportunity to remind me of my vulnerability. Almost without thinking, I twitched my fingers in my sleeves. Shadows leapt up the walls of the chamber. The apparat reared back in his chair. I frowned at him, feigning confusion. What's wrong? I asked. He cleared his throat, eyes darting right and left. It's... it's nothing, he stammered. I let the shadows fall. His reaction was well worth the wave of dizziness that came when I used this trick. And that's all it was. I could make the shadows jump and dance, but nothing more. It was a sad little echo of the Darkling's power, some remnant left behind in the wake of the confrontation that had nearly killed us both. I discovered it when trying to summon light, and I had struggled to hone it to something greater, something I could fight with. I'd had no success. The shadows felt like a punishment, ghosts of greater power that served only to taunt me, the saint of shams and mirrors. So that is really interesting. And that was something... I, I remain like curious whether or not once she has got a hold of her power now, will it have an effect on the fact that she can manipulate shadows a little bit? Will having access to her sun ability mean that the shadow stuff gets weaker or will they feed on each, on each other as aspects of one another and she'll be able to do even more with that? I don't know. Um, so he finally tells her like she can go to the kettle later, but for now she has to uh, time and quiet study and contemplation in the archives will help ease your mind. So, and she finally says, I prefer the kettle. It reminds me of home. And he says very well. Because that is something that feeds into this, like, mythology of her being the saint of the girl that, like, grew up in a poor town. And that is something, like, when I say that it didn't, it felt like she just happened to be there. At least this was, like, part of the, her trying to get in there was part of her plan. Like, that was Something that she'd been working toward is trying to get this like flu all the way open. So in that respect, that feels like she had some agency in it. But the rest of what went down there didn't, it didn't feel like she was in on any of that. Um, so she finally goes in and she finds Genya and she's sitting in this like back area. Um, she passes by the soul dot soul on the way. And they are all training and she sees Mal who is uh, practicing wrestling and fighting with this guy who is an inferi, I think. Um, yeah. Stig. And the apparat does not like the fact that Mal seems to be sort of leading this like session of fights and, and training. Um, and he sort of gets like, in his face about it, which considering that, you know, we read about how Mal is uh, going and trying to get into her room and then being like dragged away in chains. I was surprised that he was like allowed to participate in anything at all, but they are evidently not willing to really like imprison him probably for the optics of it, because it's well known how important he is to, Alina. So if they were to just lock him up, that would probably look pretty bad. But there's clearly they try and lean on him and manipulate him as often as they can. Um, so she when she's going through and, and the uh, they see these like soldiers that are signing up. Um, there's this part where she's like looking over the Grisha and realizing how few of them are actually left. Um, we lost our only other heart render to the Nichevoya somewhere between the little palace and the chapel because of you said a voice in my head because you failed them. Um, and this is when the apparat says the boy oversteps and when Mal 
comes to talk to them. Well, when the apparat like reprimands him, really, um, he, the apparat sort of changes the subject when Mal seems to be making some good points and says, why haven't those recruits been marked? And by marked, it turns out that there's like a tattoo that people are getting on their faces. Um, and Mal says, because they're children, they look like they're maybe 12 years old, perhaps. And the apparat says, it's their choice. Would you deny them the chance to show fealty to our cause? And he says, I deny them regret. And the apparat replies, no one has that power. Which is honestly a pretty good line if it weren't for the fact that he's scum. But that is a pretty good line. Um, and it's one of those things that's so gross to me. Whenever people try and talk about like, well, it's their own choice regarding like children doing something that is potentially super damaging. Um, it's like, for example, a lot of people trying to argue that underage kids will like have the capacity to consent to sex with an adult sort of thing. They agreed to it. They wanted it. They're a kid. They don't know anything yet. They don't know what you're doing. And when they're grown and look back, they will realize that you were disgusting, manipulative, abusive, and they just don't know enough for that yet. And this is another one of those instances where you can act like, oh, yeah, well, they, they want to be here. They want to fight. I'm sure they do because they're 12. Shut up. You know, um, this is just one of those things that is. I, I really appreciate that this like kind of <sighs> keeps being brought up in this series. Um, the fact that we're trying to like let younger and younger fight for us. Cause that's an issue in the last book as well. Um, Nikolai's brother, whose name I've already forgotten because fuck that guy tries to like lower the draft age. And it's like, a that's really where she starts to get incredibly heated and not be able to like take it anymore. Um, so <laughs> at this point she interjects let them remain unmarked, please, I said softly, as a kindness to me. I knew how much he liked that voice, gentle, warm, a lullaby voice. Such a tender heart, he said, clucking his tongue. But I could tell he was pleased. Though I'd spoken against his wishes, this was the saint he wanted me to be, a loving mother, a comfort to her people. I dug my fingernails into my palm. That is a really particularly like grating moment. I really liked that. This is, uh, <sighs> you guys, uh, those of you who watch Parks and Rec, I don't know if you remember this episode, but, um, there's an episode where the whole gang goes hunting and it turns out that I think Tom did not get his hunting license and somebody gets shot and when someone gets shot, even if it is an accident, you still have to have like somebody come and take a report. And because Tom doesn't have his license to hunt, he could go to jail. So, <laughs> so Leslie agrees to take the blame for the accident. And it's not adding up to the guy who's questioning her because everything that he tries to insinuate she did wrong to cause the accident. She finds offensive that he would ever think she would make that kind of mistake because she wouldn't, which is why she wasn't the one who shot someone. But eventually she begins to realize I can't keep being like offended at him assuming this stuff because I'm supposed to have been bad at this. So she starts to just lean into it and be like, Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I don't even know how to hold guns. I think my nails got in the way. I just, oh, I just really, I get really freaked out around guns and I didn't even really want to do this. And you know what? It's my period. My period is coming and I just get like, ugh, you know, like all around and just really leans into a bunch of like stereotypes and pretends to be this airhead. And just like, it's one of those scenes that 
it's so infuriating because this guy is swallowing everything she says, hook, line, and sinker, with a real expression on his face, like, that's what I thought, women, am I right? And she has to let him think that because that's the only way that Tom is not going to get arrested. And it just reminded me of this so much, this whole, like, I hate doing this. I hate letting you think that this is me at all. I don't want anybody else thinking that this is me at all. But also, in order to keep people safe and keep like, I have to allow you to believe the worst of me, allow you to like, turn me into some version of me that you think is real because you have no interest in who I actually am. And you just want me to be the thing that you expect because that's easier for you. And it's just ugh, so frustrating. Um, so let's see. Uh, we watch a couple other people spar and this new girl, Ruby, she winds up getting her braid lit on fire because she's fighting the uh, Inferni and wasn't entirely paying at attention. I'm wondering about Ruby and you know, what her deal is going to be. But she seems, I think she has the tattoo on her face, the sun. Um, I'm trying to find the spot where it's described what it looks like. Um, mm -mm -mm. I don't see it. The girl was doing best to hold her own, but she was clearly outmatched. Um, oh, that's right. And they just dump a bucket of water over her head. Um, yeah, I don't, I know it was mentioned. But I don't remember, I can't find the spot where she describes the tattoo because it sounded kind of cool looking, actually. Um, and she gets a little bit envious um, of Ruby as a concept. She kind of feels like Ruby is the girl that Mal really should be with. You know, she's a normal girl. She can fight. She's strong. She's not a fucking like figurehead for a movement. And there's a part of her that's almost like, I would be glad, you know, if he would be happy with somebody else, because obviously this thing is not working out. And that's, this is not good for either one of us. Um, so this is when they go see David and he is making the salve, um, which we find out, you know, this is like a, a bit of a thing. Um, the apparat says Sancta Alina has come to spend her morning in study. Uh, and he says, but you're going to the kettle later. I will have guards sent to escort you in two hours. Genya Safin will be waiting for you. And he leaves and she is looking through all of the books and thinking back on how, when David found out this place was where they kept all of their books, which are rotting away in this extreme moisture he is absolutely livid. It's the only time she ever saw him like lose his cool. Um, and he's spending most of his time here writing down theories and, you know, just like getting as much of the information probably out of the books into journals and stuff that he can, as long as it's something that feels relevant. Because what are you supposed to do? You can't keep these things. They're going to rot away. Um and let's see, I thumbed listless through, listlessly through one of Moritzova's journals. I'd come to loathe the sight of them, useless, confusing, and most importantly, incomplete. He described his hypothesis regarding amplifiers, his tracking of the stag, his two-year journey aboard a whaler seeking the sea whip, his theories on the firebird, and then nothing. Either there were journals missing or Moritzova had left his work unfinished. And there's this weird thing that at one point when she's looking at the apparat, she thinks that he suspects that she has figured out where the firebird is. And she thinks to herself that she's pretty sure she knows. And she hopes that she's right. And she's not going to let him know that she's figured it out. But we don't get the information about that. We don't find out where, you know, what the direction her theories are going. Um, so then she pulls down a section of debates on prayer 
and it contains a version of Sanct Ilya's martyrdom. And it contains a different version of the story than what she had seen before. Um, and, oh, wait, I forgot. That's right, because I'm saying that we don't know where, and we don't, like, really, but she has a theory based on that drawing. I forgot that she had put that together in the last book. So that's why it's not told to us, because it had already been told to us. Um, and she says, today I felt less sure that Ilya Moritsova and Sankt Ilya were the same man. I couldn't bring myself to look at the copies of the Isuri Sanktya anymore. They lay in a moldy stack in a forgotten corner, seeming less like portents of some grand destiny than children's books that had fallen out of fashion. Um, and David's like acting really weird. And she notices that his lip is bleeding. And thinks that he must have bitten it. And she's sort of like, what is going on with you? And finally, he tries to hand her a tin um, just as the guards come in. And just as she's about to take it, the guards grab it from her and they open it up, run his fingers through it and close it and hand it back. And she's like, okay, thanks. And heads out with that. And I think it's supposed to be for Genya. Um, so she goes to see Genya and uh, there's a nice description here of the kitchens and everything, which is always just sort of a comforting thing. Um, any like, you know, if you're somebody like me who grew up watching your mom and grandmother cook, even my father, he, he wasn't a huge cook, but occasionally he was up in there. It was just a major factor in me growing up was just standing beside the stove and watching and figuring things out that way. That's part of, I think, why I'm good at cooking today was simply observing for so long. Um, and so there's just this inherent comfort in watching somebody who knows what they're doing. And that is key. Cook things. Um, and I love that the servants are sort of like getting used to Genya, but they're not totally cool yet. And at one point she hisses at them. And I just found that really funny. Um, for weeks after we'd arrived at the white cathedral, Genya had refused to leave her chambers. She simply lay there in the dark, unwilling to move under the supervision of guards. I'd talked to her, cajoled her, tried to make her laugh. Nothing had worked in the end. It had been Tamar who lured her out into the open, demanding that she at least learn to defend herself. Why do you even care? Genya had muttered to herself. I don't, but if you can't fight, you're a liability. I don't care if I get hurt. I do, I'd protested. Alina needs to watch her own back, Tamar said. She can't be looking after you. I never asked her to. Wouldn't it be nice if we only got what we asked for, Tamar said. Then she'd pinched and prodded and generally harassed until finally Genya had thrown off her covers and agreed to a single combat lesson in private, away from others, with only the priest guards as an audience. I'm going to flatten her, she'd grumbled to me. My skepticism must have been evident because she'd blown a red curl off her scarred forehead and said, fine, then I'll wait for her to fall asleep and give her a pig nose. But she'd gone to that lesson and the next one. And as far as I knew, Tamar hadn't woken up with a pig nose or with her eyelids sealed shut. So I really like that. I like the idea of just like them having to appeal to the fact like, okay, you may not care what happens to you, but the fact that you aren't taking this seriously means that somebody else is going to extend themselves to defend you and they are going to get hurt. And even that isn't quite enough. She still has to be like poked and prodded, but uh, nevertheless, eventually we get there. Um, and she like makes herself an eye patch and she's working on her hair and things like she's apparently attempting to improve the way she looks slowly over time in a way that hadn't seemed to be interesting to her because it felt so like beyond what she could manage, you know? Um, so b -b -b I'm trying to find the spot. I took the tin from my pocket and began applying salve to her wounds. It had a sharp green scent that made my eyes water. Um, so 
they're talking at one point uh she says like i know i look terrible and genya's like well that's a relative term and that is one of those things where it's like i get what she means but also you do have to be careful about that kind of comment in front of somebody who is going through what genya is going through being disfigured um and let's see she began the slow work of altering my face and I fiddled with the tin in my fingers. I tried to fit the lid back on, but some part of it had come loose from beneath the salve. I lifted it with the tips of my fingernails, a thin waxy disc of paper. Genya saw it at the same time I did. Written on the back in David's nearly illegible scrawl was a single word. Today. Genya grabs it, and just as she does that, they hear this scuffle outside, and the apparat comes in, and yells, Lena Starkov, you are in danger. I don't know why he insists on calling her by her full name the way he does, but it is so annoying. Stop it, dude. Um, I don't know. Like, guys, if you haven't listened to the audiobook, the voice that she does for the apparat is hilarious. It's so over the top. And like, it's, I don't even dislike it. It's just a lot. Um, so... He tells her the danger is from conspiracy. And he has the uh, hench, his henchmen, as she calls them, march in and they've got David. And Genya starts to like get up and she has to pull Genya back. Nadia and Zoya were next, both with wrists bound to prevent them from summoning. A trickle of blood leaked from the corners of Nadia's mouth, and her skin was white beneath her freckles. Mal was with him, his face badly bloodied. He was clutching at his side as if cradling a broken rib, his shoulder hunched against the pain. But worst was the sight of the guards who flanked him, Tolia and Tamar. Tamar had her axes back. In fact, they were both armed as thoroughly as the priest guards. They would not meet my eyes. Um, so that's the end of chapter one. And when we go into two, we get this like whole story about how David is making blasting powders and they're going to try and pull you to the surface, but then like cave in the whole white cathedral behind you. A whole thing that like, really, when you know David at all, there's just no way that's what he would do. It's just ludicrous. Um, and Tamar says the Grisha and the tracker plan to drug you and take you to the surface. Here it is. Um, and she says, how were they supposed to drug me? And they point to the tea. And Genya's like, I drank it. It's not laced with anything. She is an accomplished poisoner and liar, Tamar replied coldly. She has betrayed you to the Darkling before. And Tamar says, you trust her. There was something strange in her voice. She sounded less like she was issuing an accusation than a command. And that's the first clue that this is not what it looks like. She's trying to give her a bit of a hint. Um, and then they try and say like, Oh, Mal was like unwittingly working for the darkling and he was going to hand you over to him without like even knowing that's what he was doing. Um, and she asks where the other Grisha are and the apparat tells her uh, that they have been contained and she's like, you better tell me you didn't do anything to them. And he sort of uses that in the way that he keeps doing. Where he's like, see how tender hearted she is. Um, and this is when she realizes that the deal he wants to make with her is basically, I won't harm them if you will agree to never see any of them anymore. He wants to really cut her off from everybody. Um and then she's like thinking back, trying to figure out how this could make any sense. And she starts remembering how nervous David seemed, whether Mal could be tricked like that. And she looks at Mal and she notices that he's like standing up a little straighter than he seemed to have been before. And then when he she's like watching him, he looks up in this way that she starts to like realize Oh, I think I know what they're trying to do here. It's like starting to to come together. The apparat shook his head, his expression full of sorrow. 
Our saint is being weakened by those who claim to love her. See how frail she is, how sickly. This is the corruption of their influence. She is a saint, but also a young girl governed by emotion. She does not understand the forces at work here. And she begins to uh, step back in this way that sort of makes it look as if she is a, like trying to distance herself, but that's not actually what's going on here. She asks him, do you know why I come here? And he says, it reminds you of home. And she says, you should know by now an orphan has no home. I twitched my fingers in my sleeves. Shadows surged up the kettle walls. It wasn't much of a distraction, but it was enough. The priest guards startled, rifles swinging wildly as their Grisha captives recoiled in shock. Mal didn't hesitate. Now, he shouted. He shot forward, snatching the blasting powder from the apparat's hand. Tolia threw out her fists. Two of the priest guards crumpled, clutching their chests. Nadia and Zoya held up their hands, and Tamar spun, her axes slicing through their bonds. Both squallers raised their arms, and wind rushed through the room, lifting the sawdust on the floor. So the apparat is yelling to his people to seize them, and then there, there's this entire f like fight that ensues. And uh, Mal shoots up into the flu. And then she finally hears a boom. A roaring sound rushed towards us. A cloud of soot and rubble billowed from the flu above. Um, and she says, Genya and I had come to the kitchens for one reason alone, the hearths. Not for the heat or any sense of comfort, but because each of those ancient hearths led to the master flu. And that flu was the only place in the White Cathedral with direct, access, with direct access to the surface. I'd come here every day, hoping the cooks might use more than a few fires so that the flu would open all the way. I'd tried to summon, hidden from the priest guard. Uh, I'd tried and failed. Now Mal had blown the flu wide open. I could only call and pray that the light would answer. And spoilers, it does answer. It comes at her. And she realizes like she has been very weakened by not using her power at all for a long time. So she's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go hard on this, but I need to be pretty careful because it's sort of like the idea of like getting a sunburn and then just dumping ice water over it to like heal it you feel it's like a too much right away you know um so she has to ease herself into it because her body is just having trouble handling it um and the apparat tries to scream like save her from the traitors and the guards look confused and nobody knows what to do and she's about to use the cut on one of them and mal steps in front of her and manages to like keep her from doing it um because she is a about to try and I think she's going to uh, attack maybe Tamar or Tolia. One of the like sh the ones that uh, seemed like they were betrayers. Um, I hurled the cut in a fiery arc. It crashed through a long table and tore into the earth before the priest guards opening a dark yawning trench in the kitchen floor. There was no way of knowing how deep it went. Terror was written on the apparat's face. Terror and what might well have been awe. The guards fell to their knees, and a moment later, the priest followed. Some wept, chanting prayers. Beyond the kitchen doors, I heard fists pounding, voices wailing. Sancta, sancta. And she's like, oh, they're not calling the apparat's name. I guess that's good. And at this point, she keeps the light around her to really make an impression. She's thinking about what Nikolai told her and how people want a show. You know, they're, they're here for the marketing. And she steps forward with this sort of halo of light around her. Um, and realizing like that two people are dead right now and that this came with a price. It's not nothing. And there's this young member of the uh, guard that had been with the priest who's kneeling and praying and asking for her forgiveness. Um, and she touches his shoulder and he's crying, still repeating, forgive me 
forgive me over and over. And she asks him to look at her and he does. And she says, my soldiers bear my mark until this day. You have put yourself apart from them, buried yourself in books and prayer instead of hearing the people. Will you wear my mark now? Yes, he said fervently. Will you swear loyalty to me and only me? Gladly, he said. Sol Koroleva, Sun Queen. My stomach turned. Part of me hated what I was about to do. Can't I just make him sign something? Give a blood oath? Make me a really firm promise? But she knows she has to do more than that. So basically, she gets him to open his shirt and brands him on his chest with her handprint. And it's like a rough thing to make herself do, even though she knows it's the right thing to do in this moment. And when she does, he is delighted. He smiles, even though it's this hideous injury, this scar that he'll wear for the rest of his life. She's like watching him grinning like a maniac and thanking her for it. Um, the apparat starts to stand up and she is so angry and she wants to kill him. And I'm just like, Oh my God, just kill him. Seriously. Just do it. Um, and he tries to be like, I just wanted you to get better. I just wanted you to be whole again. And she's like, well, congratulations. Guess what? I'm fine now, even though she's not remotely fine. She's just trying to make this moment her moment, you know, which good. She should. She's learning something anyway. Um, and she tells him, you're going to be accepting everybody who comes looking for sanctuary, whether they can fight or not. And we are not going to have any more fucking child soldiers. And he, you know, just tries to do this like, but, but, and she's like, does this look like a fucking negotiation, dude? Are you kidding me? This is not something you get to butt, butt about. I am telling you how it's going to be. And that's how it's going to be the end. Um, so yeah, I just, I, this moment was satisfying as much as I wanted her to be more in charge of how it happened. At the least, once it does, I, I enjoyed watching her take her power back literally and figuratively. Um, so then we hear like Nadia and Tamar joking around about how they had to make it look real and what their injuries are about. And she's realizing that Mal, it doesn't seem like he had a broken rib at all. Um, and she says, uh, I want everyone else interspersed with the priest guards. This is a show of alliance. Vladim, open the doors. Um, how did you know I'd be able to summon? I asked under my breath. Mal glanced at me and a faint grin touched his lips. Faith. And that is the end of chapter two. Um, I have to admit, you guys, I kind of estimated by going how on how long the um, chapters are in the audio book to tell where to stop this time. Because it's usually like an hour and a half or a little less for 50 pages. I'm not positive that this was like around 50 pages. It might be more or less. If you guys want to email me a breakdown of what chapters to read per episode, I would be happy to uh, take your advice on that. Cause I just, I'm using this Kindle version that really does not have page numbers. And it's like all three books in the one Kindle book. And so it's even harder because of all of the like ancillary material that's included with each book. I can't do a page breakdown the way that I would normally try and do. Um, so yeah, if any of y'all have like a, here's, you know, chapters three through six for episode two, blah, blah, blah. I would really appreciate that. Cause otherwise I'm just going to have to guess and you know, maybe that'll work. That, that might be fine, but just, uh, for simplicity's sake, it can sometimes be easier. So I just wanted to let y'all know that. Um, but yeah, I'm just like, I really don't know where this final book is going to go. Like the second book didn't go anywhere like I, where I thought. So I don't have any predictions or ideas here. It seems like they don't plan to like go above ground. It doesn't feel like she's like, okay, now we're going up because the Darkling is still up there and he's still got his supporters and his crazy, creepy Nichevoya. 
So uh, what changes really now? How do things, how does she sustain getting her ability back? Does she just have to go and stand under the flu every day? Is that, I mean, I guess that's not like impossible. It's just sort of like silly and undignified in a way. But, you know, if that's what you have to do, that's what you have to do. Um, or does she just have it back now that she got a connection with the sky again? I guess I just still don't really know what happened with her losing it in the first place, how that worked. Um, because it seems like it went away suddenly. It wasn't as if she had been underground for like a month and then realized that it was gone. The, she was being carried underground when she realized she couldn't summon anymore, if I'm not mistaken. But yeah, I don't know. So I'm going to wrap this up, but thank you again to Joanna for commissioning this episode. Um, I hope that you guys are enjoying the coverage and I will be seeing you again soon with the next section. Until then, toodaloo motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.